The psalmist says in Psalm 84, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. We are indeed privileged to come into the house of God as the people of God to worship our King, to worship him in the splendor of his majesty and holiness. And so welcome to the Lord's house this afternoon, and greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, one announcement before we begin singing, and that is regarding the In the Light ministry. Uh, this ministry has uh, been able to resume, or it will be resuming, uh, Lord willing, and we have the opportunity to host the service on August 23 and September 13, two upcoming dates. And uh, those involved who are um, organizing this ministry uh, have a sign-up sheet at the back table uh, so you can sign up to help with serving or with dinner or in a conversation with the folks that attend. Uh, we also need a speaker as well. So you can sign up uh, at the, on the sheet at the back. And uh, so that's August 23 and September 13. Let's sing now our pre-service song, number 278, 278, the first three stanzas, Nothing But the Blood. The first three stanzas of 278, Nothing But the Blood. Let's now prepare our hearts for worship in a moment of silent prayer. Let's pray. Congregation, please stand as we hear our call to worship. The call to worship is from Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name be the glory, because of your mercy and because of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Brothers and sisters, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace unto you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. 
Amen. Let us continue to worship our God as we unite our voices together in song, in unity. Number 100A, 100A, shout to the Lord all earth. The setting of Psalm 100, we'll sing the two stanzas of 100A. As it's the first Sunday of the month, we have the opportunity to recite together the Nicene Creed. This is our custom, our new custom, the first Sunday of the month. So if you could turn in the back of your Psalter hymnal to page 852. 852 is where you will find the Nicene Creed. This is a moving and a majestic summary of the Christian faith uh, written in a, a... controversial time in the early church because of the teaching of Arius, who was teaching and gaining a reputation for his teaching, for teaching that Jesus is not the Son of God, but rather is the greatest created being. And so at the Council of Nicaea and under the leadership of Athanasius, the Nicene Creed was adopted in order to articulate and clarify the biblical and the orthodox teaching of Jesus being fully God and fully man. So we have this very clear in terms of the hypostatic union, but also the main tenets of the Christian faith as adopted and clear and also reaffirmed uh, from the Apostles' Creed. So page 852, we'll say these words together. Dear Christian, what do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Let's sing our song of response to Gloria Patri, number 571. 571, the Gloria Patri. <laughs> You may be seated. Let's now come before our God in our afternoon congregational prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come into your presence this year day of the Lord's Day, and we are so thankful and grateful for this invitation and this also this command that you have put upon us, upon our lives. It's such a staggering reality that you would invite us, call us, command us to be in your throne room, in your sanctuary to worship you. After everything we have done against you and to you, it would be more proper for you to say to us, go away, get away from my presence, get away from me, rather than come. But we come, and we come thankfully, gratefully. And we come not in our own merits or in our own strength, in our own way of justifying ourselves. We come in the perfect work and uh, the perfect life of our wonderful, matchless Savior, Jesus Christ, his work of mediation, substitution, and intercession. And so we're grateful for Jesus and for what he has done on our behalf. We're grateful that you are our Heavenly Father, our Good Shepherd, our faithful Father. As the Good Shepherd, you know each and every one of your sheep by name. You know us completely and intimately, that you are involved in our lives. You are not absentee or disengaged from the affairs of our life. And so we thank you that you promise to protect us and guide us all of our days. And we acknowledge that the pathways of our life include many twists and turns, hills and valleys. We have many dreams and fears, ambitions and desires, longings and disappointments, heartaches and heartbreaks. And so we surrender and we submit it all unto your sovereign and your good wisdom and your lordship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for watching over us as a local congregation, particularly in this uh, season of COVID-19, of uh, a pandemic. And as there have been many changes in our lives, very many changes in our society, in our entire civilization, we thank you for preserving us from sickness and illness. Lord, we Thank you for medical personnel, for health professionals. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for them at this time. We pray for our government, for our authorities that are over us, federal, provincial, municipal, local authorities, and local health units. Give them wisdom and guidance as they seek to fulfill the responsibilities entrusted to them. Heavenly Father, we pray for our own leadership. We are grateful that we were able to have the installation of office bearers last Lord's Day and for the provision and the gift of men who are able to serve, who are endowed with godly wisdom, endowed with your spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that you would be with us on Wednesday night as we uh, meet and as we seek to be faithful and under shepherds of this flock, be with the elders as they rule over the flock and deacons as they provide oversight in the ministries of mercy. Give them, give us all that we stand in need of. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are unable to gather for worship because of weakness of the body, frailty. We bring before your throne the needs of our sister Ann Westendorp as she is suffering from back pain. Lord, we thank you for the, the medical personnel and for the help that she gets and that she's able to manage the pain. We pray that you would alleviate the discomfort that she's experiencing, that you would give her renewed strength. Please be with Herm as he minister to, ministers to her, and also for her children as they minister to her. 
Heavenly Father, we also uh, pray for all those who have hidden needs and struggles. We bring them before you, the, before your throne, knowing that you are a good and merciful and loving Father. We pray for those who are silent sufferers, silent sufferers because of particularly struggling relationships, because of uh, the weight of guilt and of shame, because of anxiety and fear, uh, trepidation, uh, emotionally, psychologically. Uh, Father, we bring them before you, and we know that you are a God who cares for the vulnerable. You are a God who cares for those who are victims of injustice and for those who are needy. And so we call out to you, and we acknowledge that we are all needy. We are not self-sufficient in ourselves. And help us, O oh Lord, to be humble and be reminded of that, that we are not as strong as we think we are. And so help us to know and to experience the fact that your grace is made manifest not in our strength, but rather in our weakness. And it's made manifest in your strength to us when we are weak. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our, the local ministries that we are able to partner with, and we pray for them. We pray for In the Light, and we're grateful for those in our congregation that oversee and direct this ministry. Heavenly Father, we also pray for Lighthouse Ministry in London, and we pray that you would be with them and the board as they seek to find a man for this particular task. We pray, pray that you would provide him in your due time and in your way. We also pray for Reverend Vellinga as he continues to make contacts with the Nepalese community. And as he is unable to meet with them at this point, Lord, we do pray that you would bless the conversations that he has with these families over the telephone. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would be with us as we will hear you speak to us through your word. And we thank you that we have your word. We thank you that you have not left us without a voice from heaven. And we pray that as we focus our thoughts on the, the, the depths of our hearts and as burdened as they can be with a sense of sin and unworthiness and guilt, we're thankful that there is forgiveness with you that you might be feared. That in Jesus Christ, our sins, though they might be as red as crimson, are as white as snow. We thank you that with you there is abundant loving kindness and steadfastness. And we pray that we would be assured of the very realities that the psalmist longed for and waited for and sung of hundreds of years ago. So we pray that you would come down by your spirit and that you would assure us afresh that in Christ your children are forgiven and that we have the promise of glory. And so we pray this in the precious name, the powerful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing our song of preparation, number 130A, number 130A. We will be focusing our thoughts upon this psalm uh, this afternoon in light of our teaching on Lord's Day 30. So number 130A, Lord from the Depths. We'll sing all the stanzas standing to sing.
Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn to Psalm 130 in your Bibles and also Lord's Day 29 and Lord's Day 30, page 885 and 886. We'll read from Lord's Day, uh, question and answer number 76 and 80 after we read from Psalm 130. Psalm 130 is well known to us in the fact that often it's read as an assurance of pardon, also a call to confession. It's a beautiful penitential song. It's a song of ascents, which means it was sung by the pilgrims as they made their way up to Jerusalem to worship God at the temple. Uh, so it was a song for the road, a traveling song as they would make their pilgrimage to the house of the Lord. Psalm 130. This is the word of our God. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears, let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, and my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him there is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all of his iniquities. This is God's word. Let's now turn in our Psalter hymnals to Lord's Day 29 and 30. Uh, 28, sorry, no, 20, 28 and 30. So number 76, page 884. So Lord's Day 76, this is a section of the Catechism on the Lord's Supper. Lord's Day 28, number 76, 880, page 884 asks, what does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his poured out blood? The answer is it means to accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ and in this way to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But it means more through the Holy Spirit who lives both in Christ and in us. We are united more and more to Christ's blessed body. And so, although he is in heaven and we are on the earth, we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. And we forever live on and are governed by one spirit as members of our body are by one soul. If you could turn the page to page 886. Lord's Day 30, question 80 asks, how does the Lord's Supper differ from the Roman Catholic Mass? The Lord's Supper declares to us that all of our sins are completely forgiven through the one sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself accomplished on the cross once for all. It also declares to us that the Holy Spirit grafts us into Christ, who with his true body is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, where he wants us to worship him. But the Mass teaches the living and the dead do not have their sins forgiven through the suffering of Christ unless Christ is still offered for them daily by the priest. It also teaches that Christ is bodily present under the form of bread and wine, where Christ is therefore to be worshipped. Thus the Mass is basically nothing but a denial of the one sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ and a condemnable idolatry. This is our confession of faith.
Congregation loved by our Lord and by our Savior, Jesus Christ. As I was going through my folders and notes of catechism preaching over, I think, 13, 14 years of ministry, I realized I've never actually preached on Lord's Day 30, question answer number 80. And as I thought about the reason for this, it's definitely uh, somewhat of a unique Lord's Day. It's a polemical uh, question answer. And what I mean by polemical is that it defines very clearly uh, two different doctrines of the Lord's Supper, the Reformed versus the Roman Catholic, and uh, asserts the importance of the Reformed understanding of the Lord's Supper and discredits and uh, rebukes, I guess you could say, uh, in very strong language, the Roman Catholic understanding of the Lord's Supper. Now, perhaps the reason that uh, I didn't have a sermon on this is that in both congregations which I served, I did have uh, practicing Catholics regularly at our worship services and was asked by the elders to be very careful in how I taught on this Lord's Day. And so there's enough uh, other teaching to address in Lord's Day 30 as to not cover it. Uh, and as we think about that, I think it's important as I think about these individuals that were regularly at our worship service, some of them had just come from Mass and would attend uh, our worship service, that they were... Uh, uh, Christians, they believed in Jesus Christ. However, they did not, uh, obviously, they did not agree with all the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church, that they were trusting in Jesus Christ uh, for salvation by their own confession, by what they said, by how they lived. However, uh, they still continued to go to the Roman Catholic Mass and not to uh, defend that, but they uh, did not agree with the official dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. I think that's important uh, for us today as we think about these things. Not all Roman Catholics absolutely agree with every part of Roman Catholic official dogma. But as we analyze and assess the official position of the Roman Catholic Church today, this continues to be the case. And this is why we distinguish ourselves and our practice of the Lord's Supper from that of the Roman Catholic Church. And in summary, as we look at the two views of the sacrament, and I'll get to why we're looking at 130 in just a moment, um, the, the Reformed view, the biblical view, we would say, is that as we partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper, as we eat of the bread and drink of the wine, we are remembering and we are believing and we are participating in the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ for all of our sins. So it is a memorial of what Jesus has done for us, but it's more than a memorial. So we would separate ourselves from the views of Zwingli, who just made, said that the Lord's Supper is basically a memorial service, just like you might go out for supper on a birthday anniversary. It's, it's more than that. And the Reformers, particularly John Calvin, uh, looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in the Lord's Supper, that as we partake of the elements, as we celebrate the supper together, that something does happen. Now, the bread and the wine aren't actually transformed into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. Catechism students will remember learning about transubstantiation. That is the view of the Roman Catholic Church. The elements are actually transformed into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We say, no, that doesn't actually happen. It's not transformed. But rather, the Holy Spirit, as we partake, brings us up into the heavenlies. And because of our union with Jesus Christ, we enter into his death and resurrection, that everything that he has done in his perfect life and that he has atoned for in his atoning death surely and really becomes ours. So we can know of the forgiveness of our sins as surely as we feel the bread in our mouth and as we swallow the wine, as surely as our senses feel this, we can know that our sins are forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we truly, we truly are fed by the work of the Holy Spirit in a mystical way, in a mystical way, not a magical way, a mystical way, and that the Lord does sustain us and gives us spiritual food and drink for weary travelers as we find ourselves in the spiritual wilderness. That was the view of the Reformers. The view of the Roman Catholic Church is that the elements are transformed into the body and blood and that essentially they contribute to the work of forgiveness. So the purpose of the Mass is to offer up again, to sacrifice again, Jesus Christ. 
And the logical working of that is that Jesus needs to be sacrificed again and again and again, which demonstrates the, the error of the Roman Catholic view of justification in that Jesus does one half, or Jesus does one part contributing to our salvation, and we find another way to contribute the second half. So boys and girls, maybe you've done this, something like this uh, with your parents. There's something you want to buy, a bike, and it's a little bit of too much money for you to buy by yourself. So your parents make a deal with you. Hey, if you put in one half, we'll put in the other half. Uh, we'll make a deal. And that's essentially, not to simplify it, but essentially the Roman Catholic view of justification. Jesus does one half, and we figure out a way to do the other half, our contribution. So the work of penance, the work of the mass, the work of the priests, praying to the saints. And sadly and tragically, Jesus is then but half a savior. And as the reformers pointed out, biblically, uh, we have this Belgian Confession, Article 22. If Jesus is half a savior, he is no savior. He is only our savior if he is a full and sufficient savior. So as we celebrate uh, communion, uh, we need to remember that it's not that Jesus is doing one half and we're contributing another half in the act of celebrating that Jesus Christ is being sacrificed all over again. No, his work is final, it's sufficient, it is total. We, as we celebrate, we are being fed spiritually and we are being brought up into the heavenlies by the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's a quick summary of the teaching of Lord's Day 30 and a quick um, walk through in terms of the main doctrines, our doctrine, the Reformed doctrine, understanding of the Lord's Supper. And this is why this brings us to Psalm 130, because at the essence of the distinction between the Roman Catholic view of justification and the uh, Calvinistic Reformed view is this last verse of Psalm 130, that with you there is full redemption. There is plenty full redemption. There is more than enough redemption. There's complete redemption. And that's one of the reasons why Psalm 130 has been beloved and cherished by the saints throughout many years. This was actually the favorite psalm of John Calvin, also St. Augustine, and uh, very uh, dear to the heart of Martin Luther. Uh, we're going to sing a setting, a versification of Martin Luther. Uh, of Psalm 130, penned by Martin Luther. Um, and this, this is how much it meant to him. And remember that Martin Luther had his own conversion experience as a monk. Uh, he was caught up with the Roman Catholic understanding of justification. He was finding ways to make himself right with God. And it was when he realized that justification is by faith alone, receiving the work of Jesus Christ, that the burden was lifted. I was actually speaking of uh, Martin Luther, um, John Wesley, uh, the evangelist, uh, also had an experience of Psalm 130, which led to his conversion. Uh, John Wesley uh, was a minister. He was preaching, but he actually, as he realized, he wasn't yet converted. And he was reading Martin Luther's commentary on Romans, and that began to... Uh, soften his heart, he, he realized there was something not right. And so he decided to go to St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And as he entered the cathedral in London, it's still there today, um, the, there was a singing, the choir was singing the De Profundis, uh, which is Latin for the first words of Psalm 130, out of the depths I cry to you. And so as he was hearing the words of Psalm 130 sung by the choir, his heart was struck. If you, O Lord, should mark sins, O Lord, who could stand? And Charles Wesley said he realized the nature of his own sin. If the Lord would keep a tab of all my sins, I simply could not stand. And it was through the process of this service in Psalm 130 that he, as a minister, really actually became converted and experienced the nature of true grace. How can I be made right with God? And this is one of the 
clearest Old Testament teachings on how a sinner is right with God. How can I, who has broken God's law and who has take, turned my back on him, ever be made right with God? Psalm 130 begins in the depths and it ends in the heights. It's about our great need and about our great God. And the summary of it is that assured that God forgives iniquity and delivers his people from their dilemmas, the psalmist waits for the Lord and exhorts the people of God to join him in waiting for the Lord to redeem his people from their sins. So he confesses his sins before God, the psalmist is, does, and he is assured of God's forgiveness and he asks others to join in knowing the experience of God's grace. So as we walk through this psalm, we'll do so under four points. Uh, first of all, the weight of sin, the weight of sin, verses 1 to 3. Then secondly, the way of forgiveness, verse 4. The weight for vindication, uh, verses 5 to 6. And then lastly, the witness of redemption, the witness of redemption. So the weight of sin, the way of forgiveness, the weight for vindication, and the witness of redemption. First of all, the weight of sin. Psalmist begins, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Out of the depths I have cried to you. De profundi, out of the depths. This is like, boys and girls, the emergency call. We call 911 because of emergency. The dispatcher is going to ask us, where are, we where are you located? Where can you be found? We need to give the street address of where we are. And here the psalmist is stating his location. And his location spiritually is in the depths. In the depths. He is in deep distress. And what is this a figure of? The depths is a figure of near despair. He's in the shallows of self-pity. And it's particular guilt, which is bringing him in the depths, at the bottom of the pit. He is submerged in an ocean of guilt, and his greatest enemy is within. And this is a deep, dark place. When we confront our sin, the reality of our own guilt, the things that we have done against God, things that we have done against our loved ones, against our fellow man. Uh, I'm really a lot worse than I realized I ever was. When we, when we really confront the hurt that we cause, the emotion that we experience is guilt. This is Hamlet's sea of troubles. It is guilt. And that's what he's experiencing, the pain of guilt. Derek Kidner writes in his commentary, the nature of the trouble comes out as something different from the depression of illness, homesickness, or persecution in various forms. It is guilt. And the Bible, in other places, does use the metaphor of someone sinking in water to describe the experience of guilt. And understand that the Hebrews uh, were not a seafaring people. Uh, they were, and you, when you look at Israel, there aren't great lakes like we have today. There is the Sea of Galilee to the uh, north. There is the uh, Dead Sea and Red Sea to the south. But they were not a seafaring people. And especially for the ancient Hebrews, the sea had this connotation of, of chaos, of instability. And so they were afraid of the water, the deep waters. And that's why the waters, the deep rolling waters, are used in the scriptures to illustrate the storm and the tempest of life. So Psalm 69 says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up over my neck. I sink in the deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters and the floods sink over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim as I wait for God. Maybe we've been in the traumatic situation of swimming and losing our foothold, realizing the water is deeper than our heads, and we lose this, this feeling of balance, of control. It's a terrifying feeling. I don't know if I can breathe. Um, this is how the psalmist is describing his experience 
as a Hebrew who weren't very keen on water. Now, boys and girls, I want you to think of another biblical character who was in the depths. In the depths in terms of the deep water, but was actually in the water because of his sin, his own guilt. Remember Jonah, right? Jonah was running away from the Lord, the prophet who tried to get away from the commands of God, and that disobedience led him to being thrown overboard. And so he is thrown into the sea, to the bottom of the sea. The Lord rescues him as a big fish um, swallows him. And these same words, de profundi in Latin, are said by Jonah. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my call. And for Jonah, for many saints, they feel the weight, the gravity of guilt, of sinning against God. And this guilt leads them to cry out to the Lord, crying out for deliverance, for freedom from the gravity of this sin. And that's what the psalmist is saying. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Ears, that's an anthropomorphism. And he's asking the Lord to get his ear really close. Lord, as I'm crying out to you, hear me. Bring your ear close to my voice. I am pleading that you hear my constant prayers for mercy. And there are many prayers, as he says, my supplications. They're intense. They are plural. There are many of them. Then he says, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? That's an idiom. It's rhetorical. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, if you would keep a record of all of my wrongs, all of my sins, all my sins of omission, when I don't do what I'm supposed to do, of all my sins of commission, when I do what I'm not supposed to, all the things I don't do, all the things that I do that are wrong, if you would keep a tab of them, all my bad thoughts, all my bad deeds, all my misdeeds, all my missteps, all of these things, who could stand? Who could stand? I can't stand. That's why it's rhetorical. None of us could stand. None of us could escape judgment. Even the best of men are men at best. We are all sinners. And except for divine pardon, we cannot access God. All have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. Understand, beloved, that what we have here, even in these first few verses, are a reminder to us of the holiness of God. That our God is too pure to look upon evil, as it says in the book of Habakkuk. That he is a God of righteous judgment, of perfection. And this is important as we think about God punishing sin. This is not a popular doctrine uh, in today's society to say that uh, we are sinners and that there is a God who will punish sinners. But understand how important it is. And what I mean is, is that God has created a, a moral universe. There is right and there is wrong. There is good and there is evil. There is justice and there is injustice. Which means that as wickedness is done, as evil occurs, our God of justice and our God of holiness will execute justice and vengeance and righteousness in his due time. So as we wrestle with the reality of the nature of evil and of wickedness, the bad things happen, terrible things happen, terrible and just things happen. We can be assured that the God of justice and of righteousness who governs this moral universe in the wisdom of his power will have vengeance in the sense that he will ensure that justice gets the last word. Just to say, many people want to think God as a kind of Santa Claus figure. Uh, yeah, he doesn't like it when you're naughty. It's better when you're nice. But he just kind of winks away sin. 
and uh, you know he can kind of adjust the balance sheet in his own divine arithmetic so uh, that even as we do sin, you know, it kind of washes out in the end. It's not a big deal. No, God takes sin seriously. God takes sin so seriously that God the Father sent his own son to bear his divine judgment, his proper penalty for sin. He goes to that extreme to ensure that justice gets the final word, that Jesus is the just and the justifier of the ungodly. So we live in a moral universe, and God is still on his throne. And wickedness and evil does not reign. And that's really important as we think about the perfection of God. And so this sinner, the psalmist, knows that God will not just wipe the slate clean and write off the loss. He will honor the law, and yet he will save the guilty in his work of redemption. But understand, congregation, that there's a sense of of brokenness here. And true repentance always has an element of brokenness. The psalmist feels broken, and so his cry for mercy is a confession of sin. So this is the weight of sin that the psalmist is expressing. Secondly, there is the way of forgiveness. The way of forgiveness. Look at verse 4. He says, But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. The psalmist and we are guilty, and guilty is charged. We have one plea in all honesty, and that one plea is guilty. But if there's one thing that you could ask for if you are truly guilty, what would it be? If there's a possibility that the judge would grant you mercy, wouldn't you ask for mercy? It would be foolish to receive the judgment of guilty and the punishment of guilty if the great judge would offer you mercy. Justice may cry for condemnation, but there is forgiveness with God. That's what Psalm 4 says. There is forgiveness in order that you might be feared. What is forgiveness? Well, forgiveness is excusing, removing, getting rid of sin. It's the cancellation, the full free cancellation of the debt of sin. And understand and be reminded that God is the only one who can forgive our sin. Why? Because we have committed sin against him, against his holiness and the perfection of his character. And the good news of the gospel is that God is willing to forgive sin and that he has made a way to justify sinners. This is what the gospel is in the cross of Jesus Christ. And be reminded, brothers and sisters, that what the Old Testament saints saw in shadows, we as New Testament people see in the brilliance of sunlight because we see the cross. But understand, he says, with forgiveness, there is forgiveness so that you might be feared. There's a, that's a purpose clause, so that you might be feared. We're forgiven so that we would fear God. And as the Bible speaks about the fear of God, we need to make a distinction between what's known as servile fear and filial fear. Servile fear, if we might define it, is the fear that a servant would have of his master, a bad master. I don't want to do anything wrong. I don't want to misstep because my master will come crashing down on me and will hurt me and will punish me. So there's this constant state of fear in not being able to carry out the commands of a master or lord. That's distinguished from filial fear. Filial fear is a reverence that a son would have for his loving father. A son who respects and honors his father, knows of his father's love, This son doesn't want to do anything to displease his father. He is ashamed when his father is disappointed with him, when he has not pleased his father. And this is the filial fear that's being described here. Not a threat of punishment, but because we love our father in heaven, because we aim to please him, we don't want to displease him. We don't want to go against his will. We don't want to transgress his way. We don't want to offend someone who's so caring and loving and been so good to us. And understand that this fear implies respect and implies a relationship. 
a very loving relationship and caring relationship. There's forgiveness with you, therefore you might be feared. See, the fear of God is reverence and awe for God. That He is great and we are not great. That He is holy and we're far from being holy. And as we see the gap between the creator and the created, that God is big and that we are small. We don't shake our fist at God, but rather we bow our knee before him. We honor him in the splendor of his holiness. And we don't want to do anything to displease him because we love him so much. His goodness, his kind governance, his benevolent kingship over our lives. And this fear, this filial fear, keeps us from sinning, doesn't it? That's what it should do. That we don't want to displease our Father in heaven. That we delight in walking in his ways and in his paths. That there's a joy in fearing God and living for Jesus. So forgiveness doesn't prod us, doesn't give us an excuse to sin more. I'm a sinner, good at sinning. God loves forgiving sinners, so don't we have a wonderful arrangement? No, that would be to disgrace grace. That would be presumptive. No, we don't sin so that grace might abound, as Paul says in Romans 6. No, we kill sin because we want to delight our Father in heaven and live under the marvelous nature of grace. And as we think about the holiness of God, the Old Testament sacrificial system reminded God's people that sin would lead to death as thousands upon thousands of sheep and goats were sacrificed, as millions of gallons of bloods were shed via in the Old Testament covenant, as the people saw the blood flowing, as they saw the death, it reminded them that sin leads to death. And sin is a messy business. It's a stinky business. It's a gross business. Sin leads to death. And that picture of blood and the blood spilling of death and the stench of burning carcasses on the altar reminded the people of the stink of sin. And brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded as we come to the table, as we witness the broken bread and the spilled out blood represented by the wine. This is what it cost. This is what our sin led to the death of the perfect Lamb of God. And so the psalmist rejoices in the fact that there is forgiveness of sins. And then thirdly, there's the wait for assurance. Verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch, who wait for the morning. Now, this assurance of the Lord's forgiveness doesn't always come in a flash or in an instant. Sometimes, for God's people, but sometimes it comes after a long time of waiting, a long time of wrestling. And we have this image here of the ancient watchman, the job of a watchman. Understand, boys and girls, if you were a watchman in the ancient world, your job was to sit on the city wall and watch to have your eyes glued to the horizon and to keep watching in the distance to make sure that no bad guys come to invade the city and to make sure that everyone that comes to the city belong in the city. And so this watchman would wait in the watches of the night. And it was, a, it was not a nice job. It was a hard job, often a boring job. You sat there and you waited and you waited and you watched and you watched. It got very lonely. You could hear the sounds of the night, which would be very scary. Sometimes your mind would play tricks on you in the middle of the night. Did I really see something? Was there something there in the distance? Very lonely. Required a great deal of solitude. He would get scared. And those who know insomnia know the frustrations and fears of the night. There's something very scary about the night. And as uncomfortable as this lonely job would be to be a watchman, there's one thing he knew for certain, that eventually the morning would come. Eventually, as he looked out into the east, the the morning sun would rise above the horizon. 
So there's a sense, this is the picture here, beloved, of confident expectation. There's a waiting, a patient waiting, a holy sweat of waiting. And this is what hope is in the Bible. It's interesting that the Hebrew word for hope and wait is the same root word. Hoping in the Lord is waiting upon the Lord. There is a sure sense of expectation that morning will come because morning always does come eventually. That the night does end eventually. The darkness is dispelled by the light eventually. And this is the kind of biblical hope the Bible speaks about. And so we look to the Lord and the promises of his word for this vindication of redemption. It does come. So we hope not in ourselves, but in his word. And that's the image here in terms of the waiting for assurance. And lastly and finally, the psalmist speaks about the witness of redemption. Witness of redemption, verse 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him there is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all of his iniquities. The psalmist, although he's in the depths and he's feeling alone, he has three companions. Forgiveness, covenant love, and redemption. And this word redemption, there is mercy, there is abundant redemption. In the Hebrew, it actually ends with the suffix E2H, pedah. And our, that suffix in English would be like our suffix ness. So a way to translate this with him there is redemption ness redemption ness now that's not a real word in english so the translators here do a fantastic job when they say it's abundant redemption or a plenteous redemption and that's just referring to redemption from beginning to end the full completion redemption the full execution of redemption and again this is why we read psalm 130 in light of the polemic of the roman catholic view of the mass it's not that we find out one half of the way to do redemption and Jesus pitches in the other half or vice versa. Jesus pitches in one half of salvation. We find another way to do the other half. No, Jesus does it all. With the Lord, there is full, abundant, from beginning to end, sufficient, ultimate, entire redemption salvation. And notice that the psalmist here is calling all of Israel to hope in the Lord. So as he has experienced the profound nature of God's healing grace and mercy, he wants his brothers and sisters, his fellow Israelite, his fellow churchgoer, to know of this forgiveness. There's a, a request here, O Israel, all the people of God, put your hope in the Lord. And it's a reminder, beloved, that our sins aren't always just individual. They are never individual. In the sense that there can be corporate sins. There can be community sins. We think of the event in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. This sobering account when many of the Israelites, Israelite men, were going to the neighboring nations, the Moabites, and the Ashads and the Ammonites and finding foreign wives. And Nehemiah, also Ezra, had a call the Israelite men to account. You were told not to intermarry. Remember Solomon, King Solomon. His heart was led astray as he married foreign women. And so there's a national repentance here in uh, Nehemiah chapter 13, they acknowledge that they have sinned against the Lord. And every community, every society, God's people, we have certain blind spots or certain sins that we commit together, sometimes intentionally, sometimes even non-intentionally. As we look back in history, even to our, our forefathers at times, we realize that they had blind spots. Um, you know, we think of um, the southern part of the United States, uh, uh, many churchgoers had slaves. They were involved in the slave trade. You think of John Newton before his conversion. 
they simply did not understand properly the image of God and the sanctity of life, and they treated people of different color, dif- different racial background terribly. They treated them as subhuman. And so as we look back at uh, some of these individuals who, who sought to live Christian lives, they had blind spots. And 200 years from now, I'm sure that our uh, great-great-great-grandchildren are going to look back and see blind spots that we have today, the sins that we commit in commu- uh, community. And so, thankfully, the Lord does not punish us at once, and he disciplines us uh, in his grace. But we sin individually. We also sin in community. But there is forgiveness with the Lord individually. There's forgiveness with the Lord in community. And that's what the psalmist remembers and celebrates as we think about the gravity of this situation. So congregation, as we think about this psalm, we remember that we are all great sinners, but we worship a great God, a great God who gives great and plentiful and manifold redemption. And so let us not trample, uh, let us not think lightly of the forgiveness that we have. Grace abounds as we abound in sin. Let's not sin more, thinking, well, we can experience more of God's mercy as we sin more. Not at all. Let's have a proper fear of the Lord. With forgiveness, there's forgiveness so that you might be feared. May we reverence him, honor him, understand the beauty of his holiness, not want to do anything to displease him. And let us live in the joy of living for the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the depths of our hearts, burdened as they are with a sense of sin and unworthiness of, and of guilt, that there is forgiveness with you. We thank you for your abundant loving kindness, steadfastness, and we pray that we would know of your forgiveness, the wonder of being made right with you, and help us to know the fear of you that we would live in light of what you've given to us, in joy and delight. And we pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. We'll sing from Martin Luther's versification of Psalm 130, number 503. Maybe, Joyce, if you could play this one time through for us, this will probably be a new tune uh, for us. Uh, So we'll hear it played one time through, 503, and then we'll sing uh, stanzas 1 to 3, a 503 from Depths of Woe I Raise to You, 503.
We now worship the Lord, or we will worship the Lord in the giving of his tithes and our offerings. The deacons will receive your gifts for the work of the church and for the diaconate after the service, at the end of the service. And let's now have a prayer for the uh, means of the offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the redemption that you give to us in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for all the physical gifts that we receive from your hand it is all unmerited. It is all gifts of grace. And so, Lord, we take what already belongs to you and we give it back to you for the work of the church and of your kingdom. We pray that you be with the deacons as they administer the gifts of your people and as they oversee the ministries of mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to sing. I mean, continue standing. Number 379, 379, our doxology. Come, Christians, join to sing. We'll sing all the stanzas of 379. Congregation, lift up your hearts as you receive the Lord's parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.